question. Thanks for having me back, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, good to be there. My son is over there right now at Louisa Lund uh, and uh, doing his best to weather the COVID mess and, and study there at the, uh, the internat uh, there outside of Kiel. Uh, you know, as I've looked at this and followed it, I, I was, you know, I'm, uh, I have no party affiliation. I'm, I'm neutral. Uh, if there was a party that I really go after when I've done those psychological profiles, it's a libertarian party. But of course, that's very far away from uh, having any traction in American politics. And if Trump does do the Patriot Party, which I guess is rumored that he's going to be doing, that will, uh, in effect, kill the Republican Party, just like we saw Ross Perot killing George Bush's, um, you know, capabilities of beating Bill Clinton back when he ran as a third candidate. Uh, so impeachment, you know, when you look at it historically, why, why our founding fathers put it into, uh, you know, our government and, and the regulations there was to make sure nobody would harm the union. And, uh, you know, when it was done a year ago, when Pelosi put it through, I thought it was actually really kind of stupid in many respects, because it was not going to go anywhere. It was just kind of, you know, hey, we're, we're, we're poking you in the eye. We don't like what you're doing. You have misbehaved, which, you know, that's no news to anybody, but it wasn't going to go anywhere in the Senate. Now, with this one, you actually have the impeachment process being used for what it was intended to be used for. And that is to remove somebody who is abusing his power and violating our democratic ideals, just like Nixon was doing with, you know, trying to see uh, what the Democrats were gonna do. It's just, you, know, you look at the Nixon thing, that was actually asinine and stupid, you know, by knowing this information, you have to ask yourself, what was that going to change? You know, as far as knowing who's going to be voting against you or voting for you, uh, it just shows you that a lot of times these people, whether they mean Nixon or Trump or, or, you know, even, you know, Clinton with Monica Lewinsky, they get in here and they have the false uh, perception of their power that they are kind of above the law and that they can act the way that they, they want to. Now, Trump has gotten away with that his entire life. This may come back to really haunt him. And it, with the impeachment going on now, I, I kind of look back at some of my Civil War history. And when McClellan was running against Lincoln in 1864, uh, you know, here was a general that was incompetent. Now, he did a very good job of training the Union Army, no doubt, but he didn't have the backbone and the strength and the stick to it to actually launch against Lee. He was always kind of responding to Lee, and Lee had heydays with him in 1862 and 1863, and of course, Lincoln removed him, put in Polk, Polk did not do a good job, then he put McClellan back in, McClellan was still incompetent, and removed him. Well, McClellan was vindictive, very angry, and ran against him, and McClellan, a lot of people don't realize this, wanted to give the South their country, and allow our country to be split up, and allow slavery to continue on an idiot. He's a disgrace of an American, really, in many respects, and a disgrace of a person who wore the uniform, me being a former Marine Corps officer. There was discussion at that time that if he did get elected, and thank God Lincoln just destroyed him, but he got a lot of the votes. I mean, we're talking about, I mean, I say destroy, I'm being a little hyperbolic. He got 45% of the votes, you know, Lincoln got 55. So it wasn't, you know, dramatic, but he did win by, you know, 10%. But when you look at what people were saying at that time, they said, if he gets in and he destroys our union, we are going to impeach him. We are going to take him to task. And I think that, that had that happened, that would be something that um, history would have been very favorable with, that that was an impeachable offense. This guy was a traitor to American ideals. Now, getting to Trump, it's a little bit more nebulous what's going on, but that he has for months said that out of the history of our elections, he had the most fraud and that it was stolen from him and so on. He was inciting insurrectional behavior and insurrectional, you know, uh, conspiracy theorists, right-wing nut jobs. And, you know, we see, I think now, I think they have over 400 people uh, that have been arrested or are going to have you know, court cases thrown against them for damaging the Capitol and, and uh, doing the insurrection that they did. That Trump, once he gave that speech at the uh, uh, Capitol grounds, 
seeing what these people were doing, that he did not have the guts to go down there and stop it, uh, that he just did a few Twitter little posts uh, after telling them that they need to do this, um, uh, is a testament to his weakness in many respects. And, um, and I think also at this particular time, uh, a, a very damaging uh, tactic of his if he really did want to run in 2024. The best thing he could have done is like, hey, Biden won fair and square, just like I beat Clinton. I wish him all the well. Let's do a great transition to, to power. We got a lot of issues in the, uh, the world, in the Middle East, uh, with terrorism, uh, with China. This is what we tried to do. That would have come off incredibly well. And that's actually kind of the American way of doing things, just like Obama, who was shaking his head when Trump beat Hillary Clinton was very gracious, brought him in the White House, showed him around, debriefed him. And so, you know, what Trump expects everybody else to do to him, he in turn does not give it to others, which you know, is a definition of a hypocrite. But in this case, I think you have enough Republicans that when this goes to the Senate and we will have one of the first real trials for impeachment, I do believe Trump is going to be impeached. You look at his behavior for the last couple of, of months uh, with what he was saying and how he was putting fake news out there really because our election was, it was not stolen. Every election probably has some fraud going on since time immemorial, but that it was to the extent of 7 million votes uh, is asinine. Uh, to think. Yes, I think there was probably more fraud going on in Democratic circles than there were with Republicans, just because of the critical mass of some of the people that they could move into those machines and I guess the Democratic areas. But it's nowhere near to changing the, uh, the election. It'll be interesting what historians say about this and if they can put it in the context with other elections, but that Trump was running this crazy movement saying that this election had been stolen. Uh, and that our democratic ideals and, and principles were violated suddenly after 250 years just because of him. It's pretty egocentric, no surprise there. But I think if they put him on the stand, which you know I don't know the exact process, but I think they are able to call him to the stand as a witness, that is going to be on one side, hysterical, another side, tragic. It's going to be a treasure trove for historians. But I think if they are able to do that, he will be his own worst enemy, as his lawyers will tell him. But I think our government has the right with impeachment hearings. When I, when I heard about McClellan and giving up our union, there was talks about bringing him up and showing his uh, military record or the, uh, the pathetic military record he had and to bring him up as a traitor by putting him on the stand. So I think that's what we're gonna see here. And, and like I said, I, if, I'm, if I'm a Jeremiah or Elijah or Ezekiel and, and trying to be a prophet, I do think they will find him guilty. And this will be the first president that not only was impeached but it was pushed through and you know removed quote unquote from ever being able to run for office again and will be labeled as a traitor, I mean, when you look at those pictures of these idiots with Confederate flags in our capital, or with you know Buffalo head suit on, and and you know and and, and attacking our policemen, violating our government's working day, it, it infuriates me. In fact, there's a side of me as a Marine Corps officer. I wish all those policemen had heavier weapons and that they would have fired into the crowd, just like some of the crazy Black Lives Matter racist and so on when they're disrupting uh cities and, and hurting people they should be put down as well i you know I, I i don't i don't play games here whether they're proud boys or black lives matter that they're racist and, and xenophobic and they're disrupting our society and violating our democratic ideals they should be dealt with harshly especially when they take over our capital so that's kind of my, my introduction, uh, you know, kind of my thoughts on this process right now. And we're really in virgin territory with what we're dealing with right now. If Trump does, it'll be interesting what type of riots we have, but hopefully well, how we dealt with a lot of these rebels, if you will, will hopefully dampen some of the fervor that some radicals out there would otherwise have uh, once Trump does get prosecuted and found found guilty. Uh, and, uh, you know, quite frankly, a lot of the leaders are now arrested who would have probably done something 
and that that helps us as, as well. So it's it's an embarrassment in American history and on the world stage. You know, we bequeath democracy to Germany and Japan, and they're looking at us as Big Brother. And right now, Big Brother is pretty embarrassing. I just want to remind everybody in the gallery, please uh, go ahead and, and send me questions in the chat and then I can uh, call on you. So um, until then, uh, now listen, uh, Brian, the, um, the, the way that Mitch McConnell has played it so far in the Senate, he has uh, held on to power, even though uh, the Democrats now have 50 uh, senators uh, with the two that they just gained in Georgia. So it's 50 to 50 and then with tiebreaker being uh, Kamala as the vice president being the president of the Senate. Um, but yet uh, until he's been, the, the power sharing deal has been sort of, has been dragged out. Uh, and that's allowed the, in the Senate, you can, with the old rules, the Mitch McConnell's still been the, the majority leader up until now. Um, at what point will, are they going to actually seat the, the two new senators uh, from, um, from Georgia and also the, the, the senator that just replaced Kamala Harris for, uh, for California? Because uh, if, if we proceed now on the ninth, will it still be um, will it still be 47 to 50, 47 Democrats to 50 uh, Republicans? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting that in the middle of this trial, if then the seats change, which they will, if that changes the dynamic, or do you start the trial with the same people? And even though two are leaving, are they the ones that sit in judgment? Uh, now, it looks like the two people who got defeated uh, would have been siding with Trump. So that's a huge difference there. You know, they're not the Republicans that have courage. And this one thing that irritates me, you know, when you look at the people who were going after Clinton and, you know, it was so uh, divided amongst party lines. And I'm thinking, vote your conscience, vote the evidence, you know, and, and I'm glad we have 10 Republicans that are doing that. And they, it's interesting how they're getting crucified in the press. Uh, you know, I think just like we have case law uh, in our courts that you look back at other cases and what they did, this is going to be a huge one, you know, that's going to set the tone for later on when an impeachment, impeachable offense happens, and then the court happens after the, the president leaves. Uh, what do you do when you have a change of the Senate and so on? So that's going to be interesting. I, I would assume that you say though, I, I, well, the Republicans are gonna fight against this, but the Democrats, what they'll say is whoever is elected officials are the ones who have the duty to make decisions. And they're making decisions all the time on previous politicians who are no longer in power, whether ratifying laws or doing away with them, look at all these executive orders Biden is doing, uh, which by the way, you know, I think both these candidates we had guys were pathetic in the history of America, that, we, that the best we could do is really Kamala Harris and Pence and Trump and Biden. I mean, this is embarrassing. But that, you know, Biden for the long time said, I'm never going to do executive orders because, you know, it's, it's dictatorial. And I think he has the record now of doing the most executive orders. And, and um, so he's coming in doing things. And I think that's what will happen to answer your question, make a long story short. I think eventually they're going to say whoever is sitting currently, not who were sitting in those seats when it started, but who is there currently is going to vote on this. Because this is going to go for several weeks, if not months, before a decision is get together. So that's my take on it so far with my limited knowledge of how these government yeah. processes you know, will, will unfold. Is that the latest thinking that it will, uh, they will be calling witnesses and that it will drag out? You know, just like any any court case, you know, the, the Democrats want it pretty quick, you know, because they feel like they can get a guilty verdict. And I think they're they're pretty right on that. The Republicans want to drag this out, uh, bring in new evidence, cloudy the waters. They definitely don't want to have Trump uh, up there. So the more that they can delay it and we get into, you know, um, a new administration, new things, and kind of damper the, the fervor that's going on is better for them. I mean, I heard a lot of Democrats very upset that it was delayed for two weeks, uh, even though it looks like Biden was saying we need that because I, I, I don't want disruption right when I get in. I think that was a, if Biden's goal, which he's trying to stay out of it to some degree, but you know secretly 
you know, well, secretly, I bet Biden is wishing the guy would die, you know, just, you know, get off the American, uh, you know, political platform and leave me alone. Of course, he would never admit that. Um, but I think, you know, he, he wants this, to, you know, to be prosecuted. He wants the uh, Trump to go down in infamy. And if that's the case, he should have let the trial just go. You know, he should not have held that that up at all. Two weeks is, I think, a godsend to some degree for the Republicans and definitely Trump. Trump, you know, he, somebody told me, everybody calls him a narcissist. You know, we're all kind of narcissists to some degree. We're all looking out for, our, for ourselves. But, you know, human solidarity brings us around quite often that we hopefully take care of our families and our loved ones and our friends because of what it does for us. And there's a give and take. Trump is a unique character. What I've heard, the best description I've heard of him is it's called super ego myopathy, which is basically, you know, he's incapable of doing what Socrates is all encouraged us to do. The unexamined life is not worth living. You got to examine your life. I sure hope he's doing some examination because if he doesn't tone down his viewpoints and his rhetoric and so on, he gets on the stage and he's been behaving like he is. I think it will be easy for more Republicans to come over and vote him down. And this is going to be kind of like a fight for the soul of the Republican Party to, to some degree. You know, that they, first of all, put this guy up and he won. And now they're going to have to deal with all the outfall of a lot of the shenanigans. I mean, I always kind of put it in balance as a historian. He did a heck of a lot better job taking out ISIS than Obama did. He took away the money to Pakistan, which is, you know, horrible. You do want to register and, and see who's coming into your country as far as immigrants, which Obama was not doing. And now Biden's opened that back up. We are a nation of immigrants, but we need to monitor it. I mean, he did an awful lot of good stuff, which is hard to say when we know what a horrible man or person he, he is. So that the delay, to come back to your question, the delay, and that it's going to be delayed more, I, I do think that's the Republican strategy as they're sitting down of what can we do to make sure Trump does not get found guilty, is to delay this and try to get the sense of urgency that instead of Instead of focusing on the past, what happened here, we got to go forward and do what Biden needs us to do and vote on laws and, you know, and deal with our, our uh, international partners and so on. Uh, and so it's going to be kind of an interesting thing, just like Biden wanting to stop it for a couple of weeks to get things done. Are you going to have more Democrats coming forward going, hey, we just, okay, he's never going to get elected again. Let's just put it behind us and let's get on. Are they going to really focus on this and put all their energies into it? and make sure the guy is crucified, you know? And, you know, I say crucified, that's, you know, that means that he's, he's punished and he's not guilty. With him, I, it's more like an execution. I mean, it, it looks like he is guilty of a lot of stuff. Now, what level of uh, punishment should he receive because of that? I think to some degree, the way he behaved the last couple of months, any president who, who does that, who, who has lost power, I think has forfeited his right to ever run again for any type of uh, office. When you create that type of chaos, that type of hatred, and you question everything, you know, about the election. Uh, but when you get elected, you don't question it. Because of course, you know, no fraud happened with me, but suddenly when I lose, it happens. You know, so it's gonna be interesting. And I think it's gonna, it's gonna irritate the world and irritate a lot of Americans that it's gonna be dragging out. I want a quick, quick trial. Like hear all the evidence and in one week, we're saying, okay, we're voting, bam, you know, but I don't think it's going to happen. Okay, I'm getting some questions here from the gallery. Uh, if I can go to Niels first. Niels Peterson, you can unmute yourself. I already did. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Ray, thank you for hey. talking to us. Um, I do have Good. a question. Hopefully you can answer this. In my limited view and my humble opinion, um, as you mentioned that Trump will start probably his own party, the Patriots. Um, wouldn't be it in the interest of the GOP um, to impeach him? So to avoid the splitting of the GOP into the the more leftist um, GOP and the Patriots. So um, taking with impeachment, taking the the major leader of the probably new party, the Patriots, and avoid the splitting of the GOP and probably of the United States. So wouldn't it be into the interest of the Republican Party to, to um, impeach him? 
Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a very valid point. And I'm sure, you know, hopefully behind closed doors, they're already discussing that. You know, absolutely. I mean, now thinking about that is very good analysis, Neil. Uh, you know, for them not to lose the next election, they can't have the split party. So to kind of neuter Trump from doing this party uh, and being the spokesperson and the candidate for that party, absolutely. You know, and I'm sure they were discussing that back when Ross Perot was going after Bush Sr. Uh, that man, you know, if we could neuter him and they, they did their best and he did drop out of the race and everybody breathed a sigh of relief and Bush was then back up in the polls and then uh, Ross Perot came back in and that was the... The difference. So yeah, you know, if you're if you're playing the Machiavellian uh, a card here, you definitely want, as a Republican, you definitely want Trump to lose. If indeed his intent is if he does have a, a carte blanche politically out of this and does not get prosecuted, you know, that he's going to set up a, another party, that uh, a Patriot Party, it will kill the Republican Party. Absolutely. Yeah. Good question. Or good insight, actually. I'm just verifying. I, I just support what you're saying. And I mean, there are um, more lunatics coming up. When I hear about Marjorie um, Taylor Greene, probably was her name. Yes. She would be a front office runner for the um, new Patriot Party, I think. Well, you know, we have all, uh, like I've always said, as a student of, of uh, Hitler and Nazism, a lot of people say, you know, is Hitler unique? And I say, well, of course, uh, he's unique in the sense that you have an uneducated, very primitive man full of a lot of hatred who actually sees power of a incredibly sophisticated uh, government. Um, there are millions of Hitlers in the world. Luckily, most of them don't have power. So Hitler's not unique in that sense. You've got plenty in every society of crazies and nut jobs and people that feed off fear and anger and, and, uh, uh, and hatred. Uh, hopefully, those type of people don't rise up. Uh, one, an interesting point here, somebody asked me recently, what, what would be the best thing for Trump with a Patriot Party is if we had a 19, October 1929 crash uh, right around now. Uh, something like that, that you had global recession and a lot of economic hurt. Then you're gonna see more of these type of people on both sides, whether they're gonna be like Bernie Sanders, kind of nut job, you know, uh, very, very liberal and not very practical uh, to the right wing uh, people uh, who are, you know, spreading fear and have very martial kind of mandates like Trump. You're gonna see a lot more of that. So hopefully the, the best thing we can do to have decent, good leaders out there is to try to keep economic stability and, um, and, you know, in, in America so far, I think having multiple parties like Israel and Germany would be much healthier for us, but I don't foresee that anytime, uh, anytime soon. But let's just, I guess what I'm saying here is with the Trump situation and with the Patriot uh, Party, yes, it'd be good for the Republicans if they work with the Democrats and then find him guilty in the Senate with this trial uh, to not divide the party. Uh, but let's hope during this process, you do not have an economic uh, crisis, because if you do, we're going to see some really ugly political movements out there and, and political people, even more so than what we've seen in the last couple of years. Thanks. Uh, let's now pivot to uh, Jan, Jan Bernhardt. Hi. Um, Hi. Doctor, thank you for uh, speaking in this uh, group. Um, my pleasure. My question is... Like, if I understood you right, uh, right you predict that uh, former President Trump will be found guilty in the Senate. But what I don't understand is, even if all 50 Democratic senators um, vote to find him guilty, where are the 17 additional votes coming from? Uh, okay. I, I just can't count 17 senators that I predict to vote. Yeah, you, you're right. I mean, you, you look at the, the, the majority that they need. It's not just one vote that tips uh, the balance here. We already have 10, you know, Republicans that are on board with this. From what I understand, there's a lot of Republicans that are struggling with where their vote's going to be. Is that an additional seven? 
you know, additional eight, additional nine, you know, that we we need, we meaning it's a, those people who want to see a Trump found guilty, uh, don't know, you know, and is there such a thing as, you know, once you do the vote, if that's it, is it a mistrial? And he's, you know, left on if you know, when the, the vast majority, I don't know about how the process is going to unfold there, but you are right to bring up where are those missing, you know, squad, you know, squad of six or seven people. I hope that with the evidence coming forward, it's pretty damning with, with Trump. And it's going to be interesting because, you know, even I, you know, I'm, I, I don't really have a party in the sense that I militarily and economically, I'm very conservative. Sociologically, I'm very liberal. Uh, so there's really not a, a party for me. But if these people don't vote the evidence that this guy caused a riot and didn't do anything to stop it, really, and he was enjoying this to some degree, um, then I think we are duty bound as Americans to vote our conscience that this is unacceptable behavior of a president. This is unacceptable behavior of any patriot, period. You know, the irony here of having a patriot party, he caused the downfall of our government for a whole day. You know, we haven't had somebody inside destroying our capital since the British in the War of 1812. Uh, so, you know, you, you bring up a very good, excellent point. Uh, I don't know, Jan, where those missing people are. I sure hope that we have the courageous people to step forward and that it's, it's, it's clear cut that there's like 30 of the Republicans that say, you know what, this is uncalled for, this is unconscionable, we do not tolerate this. Let's hope that happens. I am a kind of, I feel like it's not going to be strict party lines really here. I mean, we already have 10 that are speaking their, their voices. And you know, uh, McCain is coming forward and she's talking to her colleagues going, what, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. You know, this is not just, you know, honoring my father who Trump disgraced. This is honoring the constitution and our government and the world is watching. You know, so I'll be very upset from what I've seen so far if he's not found guilty. I mean, you, you, we, we, we do due process here in America. We have the evidence heard. We'll give Trump the opportunity to give his side of the story. We'll have witnesses. This is all very good. But I think it's very clear what happened. Uh, and there's not going to be much change of the narrative except probably just showing how bad it really was. Um, so we'll see. But you bring up a good point. You know, that's going to be a tough one. And, and uh, if they do vote, you know what, I think if they do do that, they're going to hurt their party even more because the people who we depend on each election, whether we're Democratic or Republican, to swing the vote, they're going to look at these cowards and they're going to be pushed more into the Democratic realm uh, because of this. So that 10 or 5% sweet spot of people who you can sway to either party, they're going to look at this and go, these freaking cowards. I'm going, you know, next time the Democrats. In fact, I personally believe that the way that this is handled beyond now that I'm brainstorming with you, if this is not handled properly, and I believe him not found guilty and then prosecuted according to our constitutional law to the full extent that you're not going to see a Republican president for decades. And it's going to take uh, something, a huge shift, um, like what we saw with JFK. The reason why the South largely went away from the Democratic Party, I mean, the South was for FDR. Uh, and a lot of people, the reason why they went away from the Democratic Party superficially was because a Catholic got elected. And the South is largely an evangelical Protestant, you know, bastion, and they were looking at him being in control by the Pope. I mean, it's very interesting when you look at the, the newspapers at the time and so on, that, you know, the South shifted that way. Why, why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up is that if we don't do the right thing, that swing group is probably going to stay Democratic. You're going to have a Democratic president for a long time, and it's going to take some type of sociological event of dr dramatic proportions to shift it back to the Republicans. And it's gonna take probably decades. Just to yeah, ask- Yeah, you, yeah you have a follow-up, go ahead. Yes, just to ask a follow-up question on this. Um, let's, let's go ahead with the thought experiment that um, there are enough GOP senators that indeed can uh, vote to convict. What happens to the 
uh, electorate, like the, the people that voted for the GOP in this election, there were 74 million, but a lot of them voted for Trump, as I understand it, like they voted for a person. Won't they lose those votes? And won't, like, just the, like thinking about the numbers, there's just so many votes that they lose. Is it well, really it, that they should be considering the 5, 10% that are swinging? Or this like very radical core group that has been maybe miseducated due to misinformation on social media? Well, if, if I'm tracking with what you're saying, the, the interesting thing is when you look at the radical groups on either side, you know, the fringe groups uh, in the left and the right. Now let's get to the right because that's what you're talking about. If I am tracking with what you're, you're bringing up, what's interesting when they're voting Trump, <clears throat> a lot of these guys, when you talk to them, really it's only two or three issues that are swaying them. They're not sophisticated, surprise, surprise. They're not sophisticated voters of looking at all the issues that are out there that are important for America. Many of them are kind of Bible thumping radicals that are looking at just abortion and looking at like prayer in school. I mean, I mean, just these kind of simple things that they get really hyper-focused and they're never gonna vote for somebody who believes in Roe versus Wade and that it's a woman's right to choose whether she wants to have an abortion or not. And that's why they're voting this, or they're voting that, you know, anybody who lets in immigrants uh, with a laissez-faire policy, you know, much more flexible, like, you know, Obama was, and that Biden will be, you know, they think there's something inherent that if you're not British, Irish, you know, kind of Italian background, salt of the earth American, that something, you know, that, that prevents you from being able to become American. They're very myopic, almost xenophobic in some respect. So this group will never go away. And, you know, uh, that that's not going to change. But, you know, coming back to my previous thing, if I'm tracking with what you're saying, I think this group that, you know, the, the Republicans depended on to get Trump in, who he lost this time around for, for many of the bad behavior, they're never going to come back in until that party changes itself. And uh, they'll never vote for a Trump, especially if, you know, if Trump runs in 2024, if he's not found guilty, that group, uh, you'll have even bigger, I think, margin of people voting against him. So I hope I, I did your, your question justice uh, with uh, analyzing it that way. Yes, sounds like the GOP is in a pickle. Um... There, uh, you know, I, you know, my, my family, once JFK got elected, I come from very, uh, you, know, you know, conservative stock. My great uh, grandfather's in the Cowboy Hall of Fame, had a huge ranch in Oklahoma. They all shifted from being FDR and Truman fanatics. They loved those two presidents to going against JFK being, you know, for Nixon and those others because of the Catholic. And these are, and I, I, ironically, these are German immigrants that were Catholic when they came over here and then they converted <laughs> to Protestantism. Um, you know, I always kind of think, thank you, Germans. It's like, okay, you know, the first German president we have is Trump and look, look at him, you know, <laughs> kind of crazy. But, um, you know, when you look at the Republicans and what they're, they're, they're having to deal with, like you're saying, the G, GOP is in a, in a pickle. I think, man, because they put somebody in power like they did with Trump, uh, they're going to have a very, very hard time of re-identifying themselves. Because what they're going to have to do is saying, okay, the new leader we have now is not going to do things like Trump, even though the way they got in last time was by putting a person up like Trump. They were behind him, and now they're going to try to defend him. Then they're going to have to reinvent themselves going, well, you know... <laughs> We're changing to better, new, improved leader, and there's nobody in the wings that I see, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I think, yeah, you're, to, to, to use your phrase, the GOP is not only in a pickle, they're, they're in an existential crisis right now because of the weird nut job that they've had in the, uh, uh, the White House for four years. And even though he did an awful lot of good, I mean, people who are on the liberal side, they can't see this. I wrote a article recently, and for those of you who are interested, it's on my author's page, when I was looking at encouraging people to go vote, and I was looking at both the candidates and doing the positive negatives. Nobody's 100% bad or, or good, and, and every presidency is black and white, 
the GOP, if they can focus on a lot of the good, the peace processes that, that, that Trump was able to do, uh, doing away with genocide with the Yazidis, you know, you guys were on the doorstep, Germans with the Yazidis, and you did nothing. You say never again, mi vida, and then there's genocide all over the place, and there's also genocide with Bosnia. You guys don't do anything. We go in there and we did it, and Trump did a very good job of stopping that. Obama didn't do it for eight years. Now, I know the Bundeswehr says we can never do anything alone ever again, but it would have been a great political thing, I think, for Merkel to say, hey, I'm sending down Gas Noin and the uh, Gebugs Jäger, the Falschum Jäger, and we're taking out the ISIS guys who are doing genocide and saving those people. So, I mean, what I'm getting at is this. There's a lot of things that the GOP is going to have to focus on to save their image that Trump did do that's good. And I think this impeachment process will cloud it to such a degree that they're never going to be able to rise that up to the top. And they're going to have to totally reinvent themselves from an ideological point of view, as well as with potential candidates. So this is going to be, it's going to be a tough road. And there, it's going to take decades, yeah, I, I think. Okay, let's pivot here to uh, Niels, Niels Winkler. Uh, hi, Brian. Good to see you again. Uh, hey, there's Louisa Loon, alumni. Hey, Niels. Hey. <laughs> How are you? I, I, there, there's so much money in US politics. Uh, and we, we haven't touched that yet. Uh, when we see what happened to my pillow guy and some other folks uh, uh, already facing some business challenges because of their position and defending Trump, the moment that Trump is uh, a witness or these people that stormed the Capitol uh, as as a witness and they already told uh, uh, the, the, the law enforcement that uh, they just followed orders by Trump. If they would say that uh, as a witness in that trial, uh, wouldn't then a lot of donors remove the money from GOP uh, senators uh, if they vote for uh, uh, letting Trump go. Uh, I can't see that they, uh, they could actually do that. And if the, the GOP really has to uh, rebuild itself, it needs the money, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, you bring up a very interesting point, Nils, that I haven't really done a lot of thinking of, but it is, is a, it's a natural consequence here. I mean, Trump, ironically, I mean, we, we all know he's not nearly as wealthy as he, he, he presents himself as being. And I think it's going to be interesting the next four years, all the lawsuits that come out and when you really start seeing the money trail and how many lives he's devastated by going in, you know, and bankrupting people or telling him he's going to pay him and he doesn't pay him and so on. So what am I getting at with that is that Trump could not have done what he, he did getting elected and so on without a lot, millions and millions of dollars coming in and supporting his campaign. A lot of people now, whereas, you know, beating Hillary Clinton, there was so much hatred for her and she did a lot of stupid things like destroying her files and, you know, and being married to Bill, who was a horrible human being, a wonderful president in many respects. So I tracked our country for two years, uh, you know, with Monica Gate, but that also didn't help her. So there was so much hatred on both sides that by me coming forward with conservative values and saying, yeah, I just gave three or $4 million to the GOP. I'm helping a lot of the senators and so on. It's something that you can say with pride. Now, you know, uh, the last year or two, people are not bragging about the money that they're giving to Trump necessarily in, in the open. Uh, and they want to keep it on the down low and quiet. As a result, you're probably, it's going to be interesting, the historians, if you look at the cash flows coming in four years ago to the GOP from donations versus what's going to be coming in the next four years, I bet it's going to be dramatically different. And that does play a role in politics. I mean, many people have encouraged me to go into politics. And I said, you know, I, I don't have the money. You know, I know a couple of very wealthy buddies of mine from Yale, but most of them are Democrats and I don't have a party really, you know. I think I would have an existential crisis within myself if I went for a Democrat uh, position or a Republican, but I'd have to pick one team if I wanted to go do it. But even if I wanted to, the type of money and the clout and what you have to have in order to do it, it's really, you know, it's sad that our, our, um, uh, our, our society is built in such a way that if you don't have that influence and don't have that money, you really can't run. So unlike 100 years ago, when you had, you know, Teddy Roosevelt's and you had FDRs, you know, really smart guys, Harvard, you know, uh, Ivy League trained. And of course, they had a lot of connections, no doubt. 
but a lot of them could come on the scene but not with a lot of money and do extremely well i've often thought just like american idol uh, i think many of you have heard that more people voted for american idol than they had in some of our previous elections you know which is just kind of mind-numbing when you think about it well instead of like you know uh having american idol we should have some like who wants to be american president and put like 20 really smart people up there and have america get into like a game show which they all love to do and then vote on these guys and then find who's the smartest and who's the most capable intellectually because you know i don't think biden is the smartest by any stretch of imagination in fact he's showing signs of dementia which you know, maybe it's just a speech impediment, which I hope. And then I, my hat's off to him for having speech impediment and learning disabilities and what he's been able to do. But he's also showing that, you know, he's had to play a lot of different type of cards in the world to get money coming in. And, you know, stuff's going to come out about him with your, your Ukraine, you know, angle. That's going to probably hurt him. Just like I think with Trump, I'm surprised this hasn't happened, but he's done stuff in Russia. He's had some stuff going on financially with Russians. And somebody just blew their nose. <laughs> Whoever blew your nose, you want to put yourself on mute. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's, that's going to hurt him. But, you know, this type of dirty money or just having to have money to, to go into government, I hope that changes. I don't think it will unfortunately. But I do think, you know, to get to your point, as well as what Jan brought up earlier, the GOP having problems, I bet one of their biggest problems, and you're right to bring this up, Neil, they're going to have money problems. Because people are not wanting to get behind some of these guys who are storming the Capitol, or like this one new elected official who's not wearing a mask and, you know, spouting xenophobic phrases in the hallway. I mean, you know, is she an idiot? You know, uh, so yeah, we got we got some serious problems in that respect, and it's going to be interesting uh, what the uh, the money does in the next couple of years, where it actually follows, which leaders does it follow, what what candidates does it follow? Because right now the Republicans don't have one. Let me quick quick follow up. Uh, you said in the beginning that the Republicans would have an incentive to drag this along uh, and have more witnesses and stuff, but uh, wouldn't that? Uh, 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 be bad for the cash flow uh, because the more witnesses they see, uh, uh, the more horrible it will be, and the less money comes their way. Well, that's, you know, it comes back to Neil's, uh, the other Neil's, um, uh, really astute observation that if if they want to save their party, if Trump indeed is going to bring up a third party, they want to hammer him and cruise, you know, and, and 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 get him a guilty verdict and get him out of the way. So it, it, it kind of like, you know, they have the wolf by the ears on one side, you know, one side is self-preservation on the other side is justice, you know, so self-preservation will say, hey, we got to protect the party no matter what. Uh, and we're going to defend the party no matter what loyalty and so on. And the other side is, you know, uh, justice. This guy should go away and we can't have a same for I mean, I can't even imagine what's going on behind closed doors with all these issues. So yeah, I mean, I'm sure they got two, kind of like the quote Faust, there's two souls in their breast. One side, they're like, let's get rid of this nut job. And then the other side, they're like, you know what? This is our party. You're not gonna tell us what to do. Uh, and and, and we're, we're, we're coming back and you, you, you know, you're not gonna fry our president. You know, so it's, <laughs> it's a tough situation. A good point, Nils. What can you say about his um, Trump's legal team? Right, we had the the five lawyers that just uh, that he had on, and then they were gone. And then he has this David Schoon and and uh, Bruce Castor. Uh, how do you see them putting together their case? And oh, gee, you know, I mean, every you know, everybody who's around Trump, we eventually will talk to them. We'll say, I was with Trump for a certain amount of time, and I've left. You know, that you had, you know, I'm a Marine Corps officer and I've had some contact with General Mattis and no, no, by any stretch of the imagination, fr friendly with him. I am very friendly with John Allen, who would have been the Secretary of Defense had Hillary won. He spoke at the uh, uh, Democratic National Convention four years ago. Brilliant military mind, took over for Petraeus uh, in Afghanistan when Petraeus left. And so, you know, when you look at, and I, so I know of Mattis, I'm, I, I, I know Alan fairly well. Uh, I know uh, about Kelly. 
And, um, you know, when you look in Dumford, you know, I've met Dumford. When you look at these generals and these incredible minds and that Trump had the opportunity to have all of them a part of his administration and showing loyalty and still being with him today and he ran these guys off. You know, I'm not so surprised about him running off lawyers. There are a dime a dozen, you know, a vast majority of them are not the most ethical or warm, warm wonderful people. You know, we, we, we have, you know, what did Shakespeare say? And, you know, any revolt, first thing you want to do is kill all the lawyers. You know? And so I don't want to, you know, we need law. We need the process. We need good lawyers to do that. What I'm getting at is, you know, probably nine out of 10 Marines you meet are really decent guys. Maybe five out of 10 lawyers are, are decent. That he ran these guys away and not having them support is a real testament to just his poor leadership. And that the legal team that he's bringing on, that they keep on leaving because they're just kind of, you know, they're throwing their hands up is a testament to this guy. He's like a King Lear. He's not listening to the people he needs to listen to who really care about him and his legacy. He's only listening to the people who are telling him what he wants to hear. And as we know with King Lear and Shakespeare, this is how you die. This is how you lose your kingdom. And that's what's happening to, to, to Trump. And I'm sure through this process, you're going to see many other lawyers bolting for the door. <laughs> you know, who wants to be the definitive of Trump right now? You know, uh, it's not a very prestigious position to be in. You're still on mute, David. So. Thank you, thank you, sorry. Uh, since you come from a military background, um, I'm curious about your, your take on uh, what we just saw um, happen in Myanmar, right? With Aung San Suu Kyi uh, won a, a landslide election, even uh, with a larger margin than Biden back on November 8th, just a few days after ours. And, they, and the new, her, her new term and, and the new parliament is supposed to start on February 1st. And the military waited till exactly that morning uh, to uh, have a, a military takeover and claim election on uh, basis of election fraud. Seems a bit similar to what, uh, what Trump was claiming and, and, and the basis of, uh, could something like that have happened in the US? Did we come close to this at all? Well, I would like to say we're, we did not come close uh, to it, but look at Venezuela and what happened compared to, you know, 25, 30 years ago, what a stable environment it was, incredible oil, and then, you know, it's just been a disaster. Um, you know, you, you look at why our ancestors left with all the turmoil and, you know, the revolution of 1848 in Germany, and then you had, you know, the war with Denmark, the war with uh, Austria, Hungarian Empire, and then, of course, the Franco-Prussian War, and even though that built out Bismarck, Germany, there was a lot of chaos, a lot of poverty, you had huge waves of German immigrants coming in between 1880, 1870, and, uh, to, to, you know, 1900 my great grandparents being uh, two of them. So every nation goes through a process uh, of reinventing itself. Uh, and it can be for a very negative, uh, uh, you know, for a negative outcome, like in Venezuela, it can be in a positive outcome, because for the next 50 years, Germany, after the Franco-Prussian War, was a powerhouse, was the creme de la creme in Europe. Getting to a coup, a military coup, it's always possible. If, And I know Trump well enough from what I've seen, know that if he could have done that, he would have. That's the scary thing. Most of our other presidents, I don't think ever was in their mindset that, hey, if I could control the military and take over the government, would I do it? I think most of them would, you know, even some of the, 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 the most power hungry ones, you know, FDR having four terms and so on, that would have never come into their minds. I'm sure it did go through. through but but especially when you when you look in the final days, right? He um, he, he he swapped out his um, his loyalists, his his uh, the defense secretary, just with a few days to go. Uh, and you're wondering what was what was that about? What was being planned? Yeah, well, you know, I, I I hope we don't. I mean, if that comes out, David, I mean that that he even talked to some of his advisors about how he could mobilize the National Guard and take over the Capitol and steal back the election, if you will. If that comes out, oh my God, you know, he should go to jail uh, for for that one, Def definitely. Um, you know, when you ask how close is that, I, you know, I, I, I've often said as studying Nazi Germany, you know, it came out of Weimar Republic, a very incredible time in German history as far as art and culture uh, and music. 
Granted, the Weimar democratic process was chaotic and governments were falling apart every six months or whatnot, and inflation was really bad there for a couple of years, we all know. But if Hitler can come out of a democracy like that, uh, we can always have a Hitler coming out of chaos. That's why I'm saying economic turmoil is a dangerous thing when you have radical beliefs, whatever side. I mean, Hitler was very, very, uh, um, was struggling very much so with the KDP uh, and then also the, the socialists. And they were close to taking over power. I mean, for you Germans, and I'm sure you guys have so much better culture and, and history awareness than Americans, but you know, Germany was in a civil war from 1918 to 1919 with guys killing each other in Munich and Hamburg and Frankfurt who were either the Freikorps or the Spartacus, the Reds and the, 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 the nationalists. Yeah, so if that, if that can happen in Germany, which was much more sophisticated than us at that time period. It can definitely happen here. And if you get the wrong leader, yeah, you can have a, have a coup. And, um, you know, if you have a whole bunch of these, I mean, these very primitive, uneducated, I mean, look, a guy without a shirt on with a Buffalo hat on running to the Capitol, another one with a Confederate flag. If you had it organized, and you had 40, 50,000 people that took it over that were armed and in military gear, it have been a different story. It can always happen. I think we always need to plan for that, that our governments we have to fight for and that the line between having a, a very uh, organized and law-abiding citizenry to a barbaric culture is very small. And we need to never, never lose sight of that and, uh, and, and not take advantage of the situation and get complacent. Uh, because we have so many, uh, you know, situations like Germany that shows us if you do get complacent and you don't watch it carefully, and you don't nurture this democracy, you're going to see some pretty ugly stuff come on the horizon. So, yeah, I think we, 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 we dodged the bullet to some degree. Were we close to having the full on? No. If I uh, it can get into Trump's head, which is a very scary place to go, if he had the opportunity to do that, would he have done it? Absolutely. That's the sad thing, and it's very, you know, it'd be interesting if they get them on the stand to admit that. Yeah, and now we just saw what yesterday with uh, Lynn Cheney uh, fighting for her uh, political future uh, in Congress, and uh, what was considered fairly right wing uh, just until recent times, and now she's sort of the, the left wing of the coalition. Yeah, well, the, she's voting her conscience. Party. And and you saw a green uh, when she spoke there. She had half of half of the members uh, gave her a standing ovation. Uh, so obviously are supporting this. Well, do you think that will fire up the other half that didn't give her a standing ovation to actually put in more opposition, or will they also sort of succumb to uh, supporting that faction? Well, you know, getting to these, uh, you know, getting back to Jan Bernhardt's, you know, where is going to be those swing votes? I sure hope the people who wanted to stand up and applaud will really do some introspection and say, okay, what's the moral thing to do here? What am I gonna tell my kids and grandkids? And what are the American people later on when they study this gonna say about me? You know, I guarantee you, McCain just put her name in the history books with that. And, uh, Michael went, I guess you- I, I, I just here. muted him. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so that legacy is phenomenal and she has my vote. You know, uh, that that courage, that's what America is all about. You know, and I, in, in, in saying all this, even though we're kind of in a dark time right now in America, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I love what Churchill said, which, you know, he's he's also half American. People don't realize his mother was this uh, very high powered woman who married into the British aristocracy. Uh, so Churchill was half American, uh, and uh, I, I love this leader. He said, American democracy is the worst form of government except for all the rest. You know, so hopefully we'll continue to show that we have one of the best forms of government, one of the best forms, you know, of military uh, organization, the best form of entrepreneurship, the best way to generate wealth in the world. As long as we continue on doing that and we can discuss these things, as long as we have freedom of speech and can ridicule our, our leaders when appropriate and praise them when appropriate, we will be fine. When that's taken and then you have a coup, because I guarantee you with that coup in Miramar, you don't have open discussion in the newspapers. 
those TV stations, just like you know, in, in Russia, people can't come out and talk about Putin. Look, look, this opposition leader, they throw him in a jail for just saying some very minute things about the, the problems of the government, not coming out that, hey, Putin kills people, he's a thug, and he's worth $50 billion, and he's raping us blind economically, you know? If that guy says something like that, he's going to get poisoned, you know. So you have the examples of these type of governments that are happening. That's what just happened in Myanmar. Could it happen here? Yes. I think we're far away from it. And uh, but we need to be ever mindful that it could could happen. You know, but hopefully McCain, this is where I think that that type of person that the GOP, if they get behind this type of person saying, hey, we vote our conscience. We don't care what, what's going on here on either side of the aisle. We're doing the right thing. That would be one way of getting that 5 to 10% swing vote back into the GOP. Because right now, it's solidly you know, with the donkeys. It's solidly with the Democrats. Brian, thank you so much for, for joining us again, for coming back to the American Club of Hamburg. We, we, uh, you're quite outspoken. Uh, nobody will uh, take that away from you. So, um. <laughs> well, I, I tell everybody when I was with my students, everybody's entitled to my opinions, you know? <laughs> but I appreciate you, you letting me uh, speak for having me, the, the graciousness of, of the, the group. And thank you for your interest in, in America and American politics. And uh, I'm well, you're, happy to come on any other time you want me to be outspoken. Your research on the on, on the, uh, the the Jewish uh, factor in the um, in the, in the during the the Wehrmacht, um, the Wehrmacht uh, was was fascinating. Something that we didn't really hear much about. So that that was a great insight. And you also wrote on Iwo Jima. What, what else are you what what else are you writing on or researching these days? Well, I have uh, you know I have the book on uh, Japan's Holocaust. A lot of people don't realize this, but Japan during World War II slaughtered twice as many as Hitler did. They slaughtered 22 million people systematically. And their systematically, uh, you know, extermination was a lot like the Einsatzgruppen, which out of the six million Jews who were slaughtered, the Einsatzgruppen did one and a half to uh, to two million of those, just taking them out and shooting them in the back of the head. We've seen a lot of the famous pictures. But Japan was doing that everywhere. Nobody talks about it. So I felt a deep passion of showing this this criminal Hirohito and documenting that Holocaust. What am I working on now? Well, a lot of people find this hard to believe, you know, hearing me, but. I have the dubious honor of having failed first grade twice. I have uh, what people call ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, also I had dyslexia, and I had a horrible speech impediment. I could not speak when I was a kid. So I'm working on a book right now called Overcoming Learning Disabilities. And there's a chapter in there about Hitler. He's, you know, he had a lot of problems, obviously, but you know, two things that some medical doctors that have diagnosed him as is being ADHD and hyperactive, uh, having a hyperactive uh, disorder. And it wasn't taken care of. And I just kind of show that with that example, if you develop poor self-esteem and have problems growing up, especially with learning, it can create monsters. We have a high level of people in prison with ADHD and dyslexia that hasn't been treated and diagnosed. And here's just one example of a horrible monster. But I'm kind of exploring that brain chemistry and education and then what helped me along the way. So that's what I've been researching uh, recently. Oh, look at all the people. I mean, Biden having speech impediment, the, the, the poet at the inauguration. Yeah, she can do her R's. reading there. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, I got my T's and F's mixed up all the time when I was a kid. So when I was playing with my trucks around my mom's friend, she was really embarrassed as I was going, fuck, fuck, fuck. fuck. She's like, can you say fire engine? <laughs> it's fire engine. <laughs> no, no, no more trucks. But uh, yeah, she had a horrible, I guess, with the R's and the way that she right. delivered her poetry and that those Amazing. words came out of her brain. Beautiful young woman and in a great mind. Yes, yes. She stole the show that day. Amazing. <laughs> So uh, Brian, thanks again for coming with us. I just want to remind everybody here that uh, we have uh, we're next week on Wednesday, February 10th at 7.30 uh, German time, uh, we will have um, Joe Walsh. Uh, he was a former congressman from Illinois. He was a GOP primary challenger to Donald Trump, uh, conservative radio uh, talk show host. And he will be discussing the current state of the GOP uh, post-election America and obviously uh, continuing on with the impeachment as it gets underway. That's next Wednesday at 10 o'clock, uh, next Wednesday, uh, February 10th at 7.30 p.m. German time. So uh, Brian, if you wanna join us uh, again uh, next week, uh, we'd be glad to see you. It'd be honored to be there.
Thanks again for having me, David, so much. Gentlemen, and I only see men. So gentlemen, all, all the best and thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for, for joining in. You can take your microphones, uh, unmute them for a moment if you want to uh, thank uh, uh, Brian. Thank, thank you so much. Hey, pleasure. Take care. Hey, Niels, you got to get uh, get in touch with me about our uh, oh. our cousinhood with our ADHD. But yeah, David, I sure. Jan, Niels, Michael, uh, all the Mikiel, uh, all the best to you. Have a wonderful evening, uh, guys. Okay. Thanks again, Brian. Take care. Thank, thank you. Dave. Appreciate you, friend. See you. Bye -bye. See so everybody much. around. Thank you. Bye bye. We'll see everybody bye -bye. next Wednesday. Bye everyone. Okay, Stay safe. Bye, -bye. bye Sylvia. <laughs> Bye, Dr. Rigg. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.